My name is Maya Petrova. I am a medical consultant at Neurosoft Company. Today we will be examining a patient using auditory-evoked potential techniques. Let's start with the technique of short-latency auditory-evoked potentials. In some sources, you can meet the name brainstem auditory-evoked potentials because this type of examination allows us to assess the functional state of the auditory nerve, cochlear nuclei, and brainstem structures. Before proceeding to the examination, a few words should be said about the preparation of the patient and the room in which the recordings are made. The ideal state for recording short latency auditory, evoked potentials, is sleep. In the case of adult patients, it is possible to record in a state of relaxed wakefulness when the muscles of the face and neck are as relaxed as possible. The room should have a low ambient noise level and should also be well grounded so that we can obtain good quality responses. We need to prepare the patient's skin. The places where we will position the electrodes, according to the international system 10 to 20, must first be degreased and then treated with abrasive paste. The ground electrode will be placed on the patient's forehead. The active electrodes will be placed on the mastoids. We degrease the skin of the mastoids on both sides. The reference electrode will be positioned at the CZ point or vertex according to the International 1020 system. To determine the CZ point, we find the distance from the external ear canal on one side to the external ear canal on the opposite side, divide it in half, and also find the distance from the bridge of the nose to the occipital protuberance, divide it in half. At the intersection of these two lines, we get the vertex point. We clean the skin of the scalp with an alcohol wipe. Then proceed to treat these points with an abrasive paste. We need the abrasive paste treatment in order to exfoliate the skin in these areas and to reduce the level of subelectrode impedance in these points when positioning the electrodes. We clean until slight reddening of the skin in these areas. It is desirable to achieve a level of subelectrode impedance within 2 kilo ohm. The lower it will be, the more qualitative response we will register. The scalp should be treated particularly well. In case your patient is a woman, warn in advance not to use styling products, lacquers, mousses, because this will interfere with obtaining a good impedance. Now we can start positioning the electrodes. We use a two-channel recording scheme with recording of the response on the ipsy side and contralateral recording side. The active electrodes will be placed on the mastoids, so we can start positioning them. They are already connected to the EMG device, respectively to the first and second minus channels. In order to fix the electrodes on the skin, we use a specialized adhesive conductive paste. The first channel is applied to the left mastoid. We use a cup electrode filled with paste. For fixation on the skin, we use a medical tape. Similarly, fix the active electrode on the right mastoid. The reference electrode will be located in the vertex area. Since it is one for two active electrodes, when connecting it to the amplifier, we use a combiner.
To improve fixation and lower the sub-electrode impedance, a napkin moistened with physiological solution can be placed on top of the electrode. The grounding electrode is placed on the forehead skin, also fixed with a medical tape for reliability. As a stimulator, we can use various devices. Today, we are using the TDH39 overhead headphones. Put them on the patient, according to the color coding red on the right ear, blue on the left ear. Adjust the headband. Electrode cables should be intertwined to minimize interference. We can proceed to work in the program. We are in the main window of the NeuroMEP.net program. Create a new examination. Enter patient's data, date of birth. You can enter related information if necessary. When you have finished entering data, click OK. Select the test we need. In this case, it is short latency, stem auditory evoked potentials. We get to the sample window for this technique. We see our montage and stimulation parameters. In order to correctly estimate latency and interpeak intervals, peak amplitude, we need to conduct a rather high superthreshold stimulation. We choose the necessary intensity, warn the patient that during the stimulation it is necessary to be as relaxed as possible, refrain from movements, eyes should be closed, neck and facial muscles relaxed, try not to swallow, not to clench to be as relaxed as possible. When the patient is prepared, we checked the impedance. We are within two. Everything is good. Let's see the monitoring signal, calm. We can start stimulation. We start from the right side. We see that the curves are displayed both on the ipsy side. In this case, it is the second channel, and on the contralateral side. We can see how many stimuli are presented and how many responses are averaged. You can change the scale of the curves, if necessary, for a more detailed view. We can see the major peaks forming, but in order for us to be sure that this is indeed an electrophysiological response, we will have to run the stimulation cycle two times to make sure that the curves are reproducible. We can see that in general the main peaks are quite stable. In case we are satisfied with the quality of the response we get, we can terminate the registration early and save the results. Then we start the second cycle of stimulation. We see that the previously obtained curves and new curves in the new stimulation cycle are displayed. We continue stimulation from the opposite side. Having completed the first run on the left side, we start the second stimulation cycle. In this case, we see good reproducibility of the third and fifth peaks on the right side. There is some horizontal distortion on the first peak, so we can try to perform curve filtering.
we observe the peaks carefully so that we don't lose important information. We see that the reproducibility is good. We got rid of such a strong influence of the reflex of the occipital muscle, and we can further position the necessary markers on the ipsy side on one of the curves. By long pressing, a magnifying glass appears and we can position the markers we need in detail. Even the sixth peak is reproduced in this patient, and we can position it as well. We stop the stimulation, and we see that we have both curves on the contra side and curves on the ipsy side, in this case recorded on the first channel. We see good reproducibility from the first to the fourth peaks. There is a slight horizontal offset in the fifth peak. Filtering doesn't help us much here, but we can see that the latency peak is located in the same place where it was before. Let's try to place the necessary markers. We monitor the accuracy. We can double check the correctness of the points of interest. We can view the required acquired parameters for all peaks, which include peak latency, compliance or deviation from normal parameters, and interpeak intervals, as well as amplitudes. This is how short latency auditory evoked potentials are recorded. Thank you for your attention.